Um, we will start, so continue actually with this proof right away. I just let, want to um, emphasize once more what we're actually trying to work on. So our quantum marginal problem that we um, consider in this lecture is the following one. We are given one party marginal, so not arbitrary subsets of the subsystems, but only one party marginals. Um, so that is density operators, uh, D by D matrices that are density operators. And the question is, is there a pure state? So we're only looking for pure global states such that the marginals um, correspond to the ones you would expect. Um, and what we learned, so what we already know and we have proven this was the first claim, which was that only the eigenvalues of these one party marginals matter. We've proved this because uh, by showing that if you rotate them individually, each marginal is rotated by some local unitary arbitrarily, then this doesn't change the compatibility constraint. So if you find a compatible uh, pure state for one set, you will also find a compatible pure state for the locally rotated ones. That is what we have proven. So that tells us that only the eigenvalues matter. Um, okay, so we were concerned at the moment, so we, we reduced uh, the problem again a little bit to the example for n equals three, so three parties, and they're all working with qubits. So the dimension of the Hilbert spaces is two. Um, and we have learned, well, certainly um, the sum of the eigenvalues must be one, because, um, well, what am I doing? Because, um, yeah, because they're eigenvalues of density operators, which are trace one. And we have ordered them such that the first one is not smaller than the second one, um, which in particular implies that and the first one is certainly larger than or equal to one half, right? Um, and likewise, the first one is also, well, any all the eigenvalues are certainly smaller than or equal to one. Um, okay. So this is anyway clear. And same for the systems B and C. And the claim we are currently proving is the following, namely that in addition, if they come, if they are compatible, then three more inequalities must hold that are not that easy. Um, namely, the maximal eigenvalue of A plus the maximal eigenvalue of B must be smaller than or equal to one plus the maximum eigenvalue of C and cyclic for exchanging A, B, and C. So there are three additional inequalities. Um, and we have started with the proof. We have actually done most of the proof already. Um, I'm going to jump in right where we stop. So we have done uh, the first part of it. And we stop at the following point. We had the sum of the maximum eigenvalues of A and B could be expressed in terms of a maximization over normalized states on A and B. Normalized states are the ones we call phi A and phi B. And then we maximize over the following terms. We have the trace of the global state rho AB, which we don't know, but we know it exists, right? We don't know it explicitly, but we know it exists by assumption because the assumption in the claim is that um, the marginals are compatible. So in, in particular, there must be uh, a, a, um, a density operator describing the total state of A and B. Um, times projector onto phi A, tensor projector onto phi B. Plus identity on A, tensor identity on B. So that was one term. And then we had an additional term that we picked up by producing the identity terms here. So we have to subtract here the trace of rho AB times rho bar A, tensor rho bar B projectors for some states rho bar 
A and rho bar B, which are, well, for our purposes, it doesn't matter what they are, but we know they exist because we sort of constructed them in a way that um, they are, um, well, if you take the projector onto the state phi A and you add the projector onto the state phi bar A, then you get the identity on A. And we know these exist without having to have constructed them explicitly. So this is where we stopped. And the reason why we could do this was, um, there were actually three reasons to do this. So first of all, we used the fan principle to, um, to characterize the maximum eigenvalues. Then we know that rho A and rho B are compatible. So therefore rho A, B must exist. And we also used that there are qubit systems. These are the, the ingredients. So we essentially used, um, I think, um, we, we definitely already used all the ingredients that are in this uh, in the assumption of the cl claim. So what we're going to use now are general known results about inequalities of of this optimization. So first, the first one, first observation is that this is a positive operator because it's a state, right? Projectors and tensor products of projectors are also positive operators. So the whole thing, the trace of a positive operator is also gonna be at least non-negative. By positive, I mean non-negative. So here we subtract something, we can sort of get rid of it by just not, not taking it into account anymore. And um, that's one thing. And the, the second, well, and the second thing is that from here, trace of row AB times the identity, this gives us essentially just a plus one uh, because the state is normalized. So we get that this is, smaller than or equal to one plus the trace, uh, actually the maximization overall possible states phi A phi B trace over rho A B and now the tensor product of the projectors onto phi A and phi B. Okay. And now this looks already very close to the original fan principle characterizing the maximum eigenvalue, but now no longer for the um, single particle marginals, rho A or rho B, but now for the marginal rho AB. The only thing that is not yet as it would be in the, in the fan principle characterizing the maximum eigenvalue is the maximization set. So over which set do you maximize? You would have to maximize over all possible states on AB together. Instead, what we do here is we maximize over all possible product states on A, B, okay? Which is obviously a much smaller set than all the states. But we can relax this condition and maximize over all possible states on A, B. And therefore, we enlarge the space over which we maximize. So the, the quantity is only going to get bigger and certainly not smaller, right? So we can, again, use another... Uh, inequality to say that this is at least the maximization over all possible states phi a b not necessarily only product states arbitrary states of trace rho a b projector onto phi a b this is sort of relax we maximize over all and not just product states. Okay. So now this is exactly the same as, uh, so this is, so up to, for the second part, we can directly apply the fan principle telling us that this is sort of lambda a, b one, if you use the same um, uh, notation for the maximum eigenvalue of the, reduced state on a b but due to schmidt so the total state is pure right oh, row a b c is pure it's actually psi so now we know the eigenvalue the maximum eigenvalue of um of the a b part but the eigenvalues of a b and of c are the same due to schmidt so this is exactly the same as the, the maximum eigenvalue of the marginal row c it has to be so therefore we can say uh -huh, this is equal to lambda 1c plus 1. Again, by Schmidt decomposition. Which 
concludes the proof. Any questions about the proof? Okay. Good. So far, um, in the middle panel here, we essentially have all the inequalities. Let me let me write down all the inequalities explicitly. So instead of in cyclic, I can also be explicit. So that's lambda b plus lambda c smaller than or equal to one plus lambda a and lambda c plus lambda a smaller than or equal to one plus lambda b. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine inequalities. You see how I count? So these are three, that's clear. Of course, they all have to be upper bounded by one uh, because we want to have valid density operators for each system. So that's another three. And they all have to be lower bounded by one half, which is the condition that they are the maximum eigenvalue. And that's just, it's another way of saying that lambda one is small, uh, bigger than or equal to lambda two. Okay, so we have nine inequalities. And actually they're linear. I, I emphasized this yesterday. Linear inequalities in the maximum eigenvalues, lambda one A, lambda one B, lambda one C. And they are necessary. Yeah? This is something we know. We don't know yet whether they are also sufficient. So that means whether any three eigenvalues satisfying all three, all nine inequalities, whether they also definitely correspond to a global state that has the given marginals as marginals. That is open at this point. And this is what we're going to consider in more detail today. Um, so I, I will now I'll make a few statements and some of them I will prove and some of them I won't prove. But you will get the whole picture in the end. So in fact, it turns out that the nine inequalities we're having there are not only necessary but also sufficient. And we will today see a, sort of a path of how this would be proven. And we will also see part of the proof. So it turns out that the nine, actually fewer even, but nine is to be on the safe side. Inequalities are sufficient, um, or in that sense, determine the compatibility constraints completely. Compatibility constraints. completely for n equals three and d equals two. So that means every point lambda ABC, so any triple of maximal eigenvalues of local density operators satisfying all inequalities um, corresponds to a pure state, a valid actually, so valid in the sense that it's a pure quantum state in particular, normalized vector psi, such that if we trace out BC from psi, then we get row A and all the others, the other two actually conditions in the sense cyclic, right? Again permuting A, B, and C. So another way of, so, okay, so that means that for every, every triple satisfying all inequalities, there exists such a state. So the answer to the quantum marginal problem 
Is there such a state? Is yes, if and only if the, all these inequalities are satisfied at the same time. Um, another way of, of sort of phrasing this would be to start the sentence in the same way. So every point, blah, 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 um, and so on, corresponds to a compatible configuration of eigenvalues. And I'm, I'm rephrasing this because I think I've used interchangeably almost many different ways of um, phrasing the question of the quantum marginal problem. So I'm trying to be extremely clear on what we can get out of these inequalities and what we can't. So how would we prove this? Someone have an idea? So I'm not speaking about the explicit proof, but, uh, but what, so splitting up the statement into smaller statements. Um, so because, the, because if that, what I'm telling you here, if that's true, then in particular, the set of um, compatible configurations for eigenvalues must be a polytope because it is bounded by a finite number of linear inequalities in the, in the components, right? That's, that's what it says. So in particular, it's a polytope. Um, so how do we prove that something is a polytope? Um, well, we can, there are different, different options for sure. But the way this statement can in particular be proven is to first show it's actually a convex set. So first we show convexity. And once we know it's convex, we still have these nine inequalities. And we don't know whether they are sufficient, right? Whether, whether they are all or whether they are more. And we haven't even shown it's a polytope. And then the next step you could do is you go to all extreme points of these nine inequalities and you show that they indeed correspond to a valid configuration of eigenvalues. And once we have shown it's convex and all the extreme points belong to the set, it must be exactly the polytope um, containing, uh, sorry, the polytope char being characterized by these inequalities. That is, the, that is the idea. And we will also go this path but we will not show the convexity explicitly. Okay. Um, um, ah, yeah, so let me first state again this, uh, the fact that this implies that a set of valid co configurations is a polytope. So in particular, the set of compatible eigenvalues is a polytope. So far, we know that this is true for n equals 3 and d equals 2. It will turn out it's true for any n and any d. But so far, given that claim, it's only a statement about the n equals 3, d equals 2 case. Okay, so how prove this statement? How to prove this statement? So as I said before, if we can show that first this set is convex, um, So maybe maybe this is like this. So um, set of compatible maximal eigenvalues is convex. That would be step one. Um, and then we would have to show that all the extreme points of the nine inequalities are actually inside this set. Um, of the polytope defined by the nine inequalities are inside the set. 
Okay, and once we have shown that all the extreme points of the polytope defined by the nine inequalities are inside the set, and the set must be convex, then the set must be equal to exactly this polytope. <clears throat> um, the first part is actually uh, doable, but tricky. So this is the part that is involved with irreducible representations of SLD to the Cartesian power n. And then you sort of find that, OK, let me not let me not go into it, but you have to work with homogeneous polynomials of, on the Hilbert space and irreducible representation of this group. And then you find that each irreducible representation of this group corresponds to one rational point that is compatible. So you only find the rational points. And then you can show that if you take the closure, of course, of the rational points, you sort of get the full set with real points. That's just like it, like it is from Q to R. Um, and then you have understood that this thing must be must be convex. So you, you actually do not even only prove it's convex, you show a way of how to construct it, namely by going to the irreducible representations of this group on a specific uh, Hilbert space. Okay, um, so that's complicated and it has been done, uh, for instance, in a paper by Michael Walter, Brent Doran, and Matthias Christandl, Uh, and David Gross in 2003, I think, no, 13, actually, sorry, 2013. And that's, that was a science article. And so I, I encourage you to look that up. It's actually a very nice article. And, and um, this is also the first time I've heard about the quantum marginal problem when Matthias Christandl, who was at the time a professor at ETH, together with Michael Walter, who was a, a PhD, or at that time maybe already a postdoc at ETH, uh, presented this topic to me for the first time in, when was this? 2013, I think that was in the year of the publication. Yes, okay, it's been a while. Good, so so um, I may go, I have not yet decided. So one option for next Wednesday is to go into the proof idea of this and show you a little bit more about what's behind it. But it, this is a technical thing. So we will learn a lot about the techniques not so much about the concepts. I'm not, not yet decided where I'm going to do this. That's, that's one option. But what we can certainly do is we can draw the polytope for these nine inequalities, and we can check explicitly that each of the extreme points of that polytope are a valid configuration, so are compatible maximal eigenvalues. This is something we can do. And by doing this, it's actually a very interesting uh, task to do because we learn a lot more about the three-party qubit case than just about compatibility. So we, we actually see something about, it's a sort of a nice picture of showing different types of entanglement. It's really, it's really nice. So I'm looking forward to, to doing that explicitly here. Actually today. So this is something we do and we do it now. And I need some space. Um, so I'm giving my best to, um, to give you a nice drawing of a, three-dimensional polytope on a blackboard. I've practiced, so not on a blackboard, but I've practiced on paper. So let's see. Okay. So we need um, three axes. Wow, that was not such a good start. <laughs> um, okay, let me let me do it properly with this thing. Yeah, let's let's try to do it nicely. Okay, we need. Three axes um, for the three dimensions. 
of the la uh, lambda. So that would be the maximum eigenvalue of C. That would be the maximum eigenvalue of A. And here the maximum eigenvalue of B. And I'm only going to write it down once. I know it doesn't conflict with any other lines I'm going to draw. Um, OK, now we can actually read nicely here. OK, that's nice. And like this. This will be proved by picture. <laughs> Proof by example? No, proof by picture. OK, good. So here we have, actually, so the point we start with is not the zero point, because we already know that all the eigenvalues have to be at least 1 half. So this is the point 1 half, 1 half, 1 half here. And this is consequently the point of 1, 1 half, 1 half, and so on. Uh -huh. Here, one half, one half, one. Good, let's go ahead. So we have actually a full cube that helps us doing this task. Okay. Oh, I already see the next problem coming. This is really bad. I should have started below. Hmm. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Let's do it properly. We have the time. Okay, do it on all of this. Sorry. I hope you were a bit more lucky. Okay, so it was a bit too much. Huh? It was a bit too much. So I have to. Yeah, I have to be a bit smaller. Okay. Okay. Now the diagonal. And okay, now I think now now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so this is our our cube. Good. So we have a cube now. Next, let me use a color. Yeah. Yeah, they're still the same. So this would be one half, one half, one. This would be one, one half, one half. That is still one half, one half, one half. And that one doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, okay. Good. So what is the inequality? Okay, so certainly, certainly everything has to happen within this cube because we have each eigenvalue is greater than or equal to one half and smaller than or equal to one, okay? So the, the front facet, for instance, corresponds to the condition that lambda <clears throat> B would be smaller than or equal to one half, okay? And now the question is, what are the other facets? The other facets, I've erased them. The other facets are lambda one, lambda A plus lambda B is smaller than one, plus lambda c, and so on. So I'm going to draw them. In fact, the other facets are those that we obtain from um, connecting the three extreme points down here with the point 1, 1, 1. Okay, so um, um, yeah, there's actually another line here, this one. Yeah. Okay, so here we already have um, sort of a pyramid. You can see it, right? Um, so we have a pyramid in green, which has um, a triangle 
as its base. The triangle are the three extreme points with two of the eigenvalues being one half, one of the eigenvalue being one. So this one, this one, and this one. And then you have the other extreme point up here, which would be the one, 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 which is definitely a valid configuration as well. But then we still have another pyramid, actually a quite smaller one, which goes in the other direction. So from these extreme points that I mentioned before, you can also go down here to the sort of the one half, one half, one half point. And this is the, the polytope that is bounded by these nine inequalities. So not all inequalities are needed in fact. So the, the, the inequality that the eigenvalues must be smaller than or equal to one is not needed explicitly because it's taken care of one of the three additional inequalities by um, Sudbury, Iguchi and Schulz. So that means inequality suffice. One, two, three, four, five, six. And they are, um, so these are the three inequalities for lambda A, B, and C greater than or equal than one half. And then we have three more here, here, and here. Three inequalities, lambda A, one, plus lambda B, one, smaller than or equal to one, plus lambda C, one, and cyclic. Can you sort of, is that? Mm -hmm. No, it has six facets and five vertices. So there is, it's, it's a, you, it's like you collate two pyramids with the same base. The base is the triangle here, which connects this point, this point, and the maximal, the extreme point on the, on the lambda B axis. Okay, and then the first pyramid is sort of a, a longer one, um, culminating in this one, one, one point, and the second one is a bit of a shorter one, culminating in the one half, one half, one half uh, point. Okay, and now I can also sort of say this is the lambda 1b axis, and now I can write it down. Um, okay, so, so that's the polytope. Um, let's investigate the extreme points. There are five. One, two, three, four, five. Maybe highlight them a bit. Mm hmm So the first one is one, one, one. That means the maximum eigenvalues of all marginals are one, sort of the maximal thing you can do. Um, in particular, all marginals are pure themselves. That's the only, only option that to have these eigenvalues. So all marginals pure. And an example of a state that, that, that realizes this would be zero, zero, zero. Okay, so that's definitely an option for the global state psi. So that would be psi A, B, C, or as we called it, N in general. And, and realize, so importantly, remember that we have this freedom of local unitaries on all the subsystems, which we needed to argue that only the eigenvalues matter. Therefore, we can give many examples. We can, any, any state of the type pure, pure, pure is, valid, is a valid example. We can anyway only give this up to, um, up to this unitary freedom local, locally. Okay, so remember, local unitary freedom. So we can only give representatives of the global state corresponding to either extreme point. So that was the point up here. What about the point down here? 
sort of the one half, one half, one half. That means, so if the maximum eigenvalues of the qubit marginals are one half, that means that the qubit marginals are fully mixed. All marginals are fully mixed. And there is one particular type of state that has this property for the three party case, which is the so-called GHZ state. And of course, again, here you have this unitary freedom. So I'm going with zero and one. So that's an example. So now we have shown that for these two, these extreme points are definitely valid because they do allow for a global pure state with the corresponding marginals. Now we go to these three extreme points, which are of a different nature. Um, let's start with one, one half, one half. So that means that the subsystem A is pure. And if a subsystem of a bigger system is pure, we automatically know that it is also uncorrelated. So in tensor product form with anything else, right? A pure state, which is a marginal of a bigger state, is must necessarily be a tensor product with everything else. So... From here, we know that um, the A part must be pure and uncorrelated. And now we have for the systems P and C, we have again fully mixed marginals. So give me a pure state on B and C that has fully mixed marginals of, of, its, of its subsystems. Any of the maximally entangled states will do. So for instance, zero, zero, plus one, one. So it works. And now you get the idea, right? So now we have considered the points down here, but of course this and this point are symmetric on the permutation of, uh, of A with B and C. So there it's just another system that is pure tensor, one of the maximally entangled states on the other two systems. So for one half, one, one half, and one half, one half, one, we do it the same way. Okay. Um, there is one more point I'd like to highlight. Just using the, the free space up here. Um, let's call it W, which is the point two thirds, two thirds, two thirds. Um, where is this point going to lie in the polytope? You have an idea. On the basis, right. So certainly it's on the connecting line between these two points. It must be because it's uh, same indices for all three dimensions. And it turns out it's actually in the basis plane of, this, of these two pyramids. This is the W point. And I'm using maybe red for this. Okay, so W. So this is the... basis plane okay and w is lying in the middle here what state does it correspond to because now we, we, have, we have actually shown that all the extreme points are valid so we also know w must also be valid necessarily and um, knowing that this whole construction must uh, the whole set must be convex um does someone have an idea what W would correspond to? What state? Yeah, it's the W state. <laughs> but the question is, how does it look? 
it's really it's really called W state, so that's why I'm calling the point W. <laughs> okay, that is a that is a very important point to be mentioned. Um, so the question is, what are convex? What do convex co combinations of different points, in particular of extreme points, correspond to? And it's not as easy as it was with probability distributions. We have to be very careful. With probability distributions, the convex combinations were nothing else but a probabilistic mixture of probability distributions. Very easy to get intuitively what this is. Here, much more complicated. Because, having, yeah, because it's true that W is a convex combination of this, this, and this extreme point, each with a weight of one third. Do the calculation, that's easily done, right? So you know it's certainly within the set, but what do you know about the state? The state is not a convex combination of this state and the corresponding ones for the other two, because that would not even be pure. So it's not, it's not that there is no a correspondence between convex, convex combinations of maximum eigenvalues and convex combinations of, of pure states. That's not how it works here. It's very important to keep that in mind. So I'm very happy that this came up. I was going to say this anyway. Okay, so let me tell you about the W state which is also a type of maximally entangled state of three qubits, but a different type than the GHZ or the maximally entangled states of two of the three parties. So W states corresponds to the following. It is, um, it is the entangled state with sort of one excitation, but you don't know where it is. Or well, you don't know, okay. One excitation, a superposition of of one excitation out of the three. So that means one zero zero plus zero one zero plus zero zero one normalized by square root of three. Okay, now it's also rather easy to see that if you try to sort of convexly combine these three states of the maximal entangled states of two parties, you will not get there. Um, because, well, why, do, why, why, why will you not? Well, okay, depends. You still have this unitary freedom, but at least not with the one that we started with, because you have either no excitation or two. Okay, now you could sort of playing this game with another maximal entangled state, but already this unitary freedom should warn you that this intuition is not going to work here. Um, so the reason I'm highlighting this is because there we see that different regions within this polytope correspond to different type of entanglement. Here we have no entanglement. Um, here we have GHZ type of entanglement. And then we have um, sort of Two qubit maximal entanglement in the in the original sense of the maximally entangled states of two qubits, and here we have W type entanglement. Um, and this is very interesting because that's not only the case for the n equal three d equals two case, but also for more parties or other types of systems. The polytope has different regions in that case it was pyramids as different sort of pyramids glued to each other and different pyramids correspond to different types of entanglement which is actually the story the the authors michael uh, and and so on used to bring this paper into science right i mean they had this technical result which was astonishing in the first place and nicely done but then how do you sell it to one of the good good journals so you need to have a good story. And the story was entanglement and types of entanglement. And it works because it's really interesting to see these types of entanglement in, inside this polytope. So I'm not trying to, uh, to downgrade the result, even, even quite the opposite. I think it's a great result. And they could connect it to different types of entanglement of multi-party systems, which was um, the main, main uh, point that, was, that sold it very well. Okay, so so much about my drawing skills. Um, okay, I haven't shown to you that um, the set of compatible maximal eigenvalues is convex, but that's actually true for arbitrary n 
so number of parties, and D, dimension of the systems they're working with. Um, and yeah, as I said, maybe maybe we'll focus on this on this a bit more uh, next Wednesday, or something else. I'll, I'll see. Let's see. Good. Have a nice uh, afternoon. Mm -hmm.